This started with a dream. So I brought it up to Pastor Ryan and thought, there's no way this can work. Logistically, it seemed too hard. Um, me being the only doctor and not knowing any other medical staff in the church, I didn't think it was possible, but of course, our plans are never <laughs> as good as God's plan. We felt the calling upon our hearts to to give back um, what God has already given us in time and money and faith of stepping out um, and stepping out of our comfort zone. And so we decided as a family that it would be a really good opportunity um, to go fulfill that calling in our life and uh, the vision of bringing Jesus uh, to uh, the world. We had our first interest meeting and to my surprise, which I should know by now not to be surprised by what God does, people came. First thing that happened was myself and Isabel went out to Kenya um, to secure some medication and supplies that we couldn't get in the States. That um, in itself was supposed to be easy and seamless. Um, we packed about three to four, four bags, I believe, of medication and supplies and testing strips, um, thinking that that would be an easier way to get, um, to break up the shipment from the team. So I had to drop off the team and then I had to take my uh, personal vehicle uh, by myself uh, back into LA and dropped it off at a parking lot. And then just dealing with that, just traffic and um, trying to get back to the team. And I was on a bus with probably a hundred people in a bus, crammed tight with my own personal luggage, um, stressing because I was getting phone calls from the team like, hey, where are you at? Where are you at? Um, you need to get back here. We're checking in our gear and our luggage. And um, so that was kind of just, that was the start, right? And I remember sweating um, because I was running through the terminal, uh, trying to get back in line with the team. When we flew into Burundi, and from that point on, it was very, it was a lot of patience, <laughs> a lot of waiting and not really knowing what we were doing um, because we literally were at the mercy of the people there at the airport. Um, a lot of our bags didn't make it into Burundi. They got left in Kenya. And so just trying to get those bags um, was a whole process. And then once those bags did get into Burundi, <laughs> trying to get those was also a whole whole process. Um, I remember at one point, Isabel and Dr. Rita were escorted off the airport and <laughs> I had no idea where they were going. And we didn't see them for a couple of hours. Um, they were being interrogated just about what we were bringing and why we were coming into the country with all this medical supplies. The luggage that we had with us that carried medication and testing supplies was immediately confiscated. And myself and Isabel, uh, we were nicely escorted by the uh, Burundi military to the customs uh, facility to start the negotiations about the uh, taxes that we would have to pay on each and every item that was brought into the country. Even though we were not staying in Burundi, we were transient, um, we still had to, to give taxes. A little bit of fear came over me in the fact that we had left by, behind um, half of the team that didn't understand the culture of, of, um, of Africa in general. So at one point, I remember asking Isabel you know, we should probably go back and check on the team to make sure that they're okay. And so we left Dr. Bob there to continue with the negotiations that took very, very long. And um, to our surprise, which I do remember gasping, um, we came back and we saw a huge crowd 
And, and my initial fear was like, oh no, there's a mob or they're starting to get mugged because they're foreigners. Um, and as we started to walk faster to, to the crowd, we realized that they were worshiping. And at that point, I know Isabel and I just kind of stopped and looked at each other and we were like, why are we worried? God has got this. So one of the challenges in, in going into Baraka in the eastern part of the Congo is the travel to get there. Baraka is located on Lake Tanganyika. Lake Tanganyika is part of the challenge of getting there. But just the, the, the dynamics of having to uh, go from California through Europe or the Middle East somewhere and into Africa and then over trying to get into Congo. This year, the route was to go through Burundi. Um, because of crossing Lake Tanganyika from Tanzania is so difficult. Uh, my thought was that Burundi would be easier. What I didn't know at the time, found out later, is that Lake Tanganyika is, is radically flooded, more than ever before. The whole village is uh, underwater, and then the border itself is underwater. And on the Congo side, uh, travails of flooding, you know, to get through to the other side. Getting from Burundi into the Congo, driving through all that water was very nerve-wracking. <laughs> um, I didn't think we were going to make it. I mean, we made it into the Congo this afternoon, but the flooding on Lake Tanganyika is so bad um, that just uh, just getting across and getting into Uvira is, is a major a major problem. We've been through several different um, obstacles on the road and we're stuck again because uh, over this way there's a truck stuck in the mud and a tractor trying to fix the road and uh, as you can see as uh, Isabel will, will pan around behind us we're all backed up here waiting to get across the road. But we are in the Congo and uh, maybe by tomorrow we'll get down to Baraka. spend the night in a, in a hotel um, and then the next morning was going to be what I was told a three to four hour boat ride to Baraka. Um, I do not like boats. I have a very, <laughs> very, I'm very afraid of boats um, and so when we got on this boat it was a little windy and a little choppy and so I was just like oh my gosh. Lord, I don't know if I can do this for three to four hours. The boat uh, throughout the trip was taking on water and it was just, but that was just kind of the accepted part of the travel. And um, I helped one of the gentlemen uh, every uh, hour or so, we'd get down in there with a big, you know, five gallon bucket. And we'd scoop out the water from the bottom of the boat uh, to try to keep it um, from sinking, which would not be a good thing. So we're here in the Congo, still trying to get to Baraka. Uh, this is our boat behind me. Um, we we're on our way coming from Barak or, uh, Uvira to Baraka and the water got really rough so they decided to take a break. So we we're parked here on the side, a little village along the way and uh, the uh, pilot and the co-pilot left the boat and have gone ashore to get to Mugali, find something to eat and we're just sitting here waiting to continue on down south. So this is, this is how we roll in the Congo. And I just remember um, you know, this isn't a boat that you see in America, right? In America, you have regulations, you've got life jackets and electronics and lights and navigation. And this was a boat that had none of that. It had a motor and a guy sitting on the front of the boat with a flashlight. Um, as we were approaching Baraka, had about, I believe about 10 o'clock at night, the sun was down. Um, the way that we navigated was, like I said, there was a 
a gentleman sitting on the front of the boat with a big flashlight. He was kind of waving it back and forth and that was the navigation. And so again, just a, a challenge um, to our own personal uh, journey of just trusting in the Lord. Like, hey Lord, you have us here and this is where we're at and it's difficult. And our bottoms were very sore from sitting for so long and our you know, faces were windblown being on the, the water for that long and we were all hungry and exhausted. The morning that we were supposed to start the clinic, um, I had like literally less than an hour to try and teach some other of the team members basically how to be a nurse. <laughs> um, my first impression of what I saw was just like desperation. Um, and hopelessness. You could see it in their eyes. Um, there, it was a building, but there was nothing in the building. Um, just a bunch of empty rooms. And you just saw all these people just sitting in the hot sun. So the medical clinic was essentially a bunch of uh, cemented walls. Um, some doorways had doors, but there was no shelving, there was no, um, they call it a clinic, but it, we made it a clinic essentially. So we were able to um, set up IV stations, we were able to set up, and we did a lot of that with um, command wall hanging strips. We had no ivy poles. Um, for the pharmacy, we just turned boxes over and our storage totes, and we, uh, we set up a makeshift pharmacy. Um, we organized it alphabetically or by um, treatment, and, um, and there was two small rooms that the doctors had used for um, seeing the patients. Mm -hmm. The uh, patients that were not from the church, but in line for the hospital, gravitated to our space. But, and not surprisingly, the staff did too. Um, the staff asked uh, to learn from our team, not knowing that our team was learning at the same time. <laughs> the theme of the clinic was give yourself to the Holy Spirit and he will, he will guide you because no one besides myself, Bree, uh, Rudy, and Kevin had touched patients, had drawn blood from patients, had done blood pressures, had done vitals, had done malaria testing, had done pregnancy testing, um, typhoid testing. So this was completely new. So, and watching everyone gravitate to the people who had never done it before, like this was their 10th time doing a pop-up clinic in, in Africa was just a blessing for me to watch, for sure. I actually didn't know that it was going to be medical until further on um, as I was planning to go, which was um, which was actually amazing because I, I feel called to the medical field. Um, I want to go into a medical profession um, in the future and um, to, to, to learn about the trip actually being a, a medical mission trip um, was something that, that was just amazing um, because of my interest in the medical field and God's calling for me in the medical field. So um, to, for it to roll out as a medical, medical outreach was um, just the work of God.
One of the families in the pharmacy had came in and they were um, the, these twin boys and they had never um, spoken a word in five years. And so these parents were very, um, very concerned. Um, and at the most, they had nothing else wrong. They were physically well. Um, we gave them vitamins, we treated them for parasites, but other than that, there was nothing that we could treat for them. Um, and um, it came to our attention, though, that they were spiritually being spiritually possessed. And I had the opportunity to pray over them with Pastor Brian and Cassandra. And it was um, just a very special moment to be in such deep prayer with them and to see him released um, from some of these demonic sources and yes. so Pastor Asakulu has given us an update that um, he has followed up with this family um, that the boys are now speaking little words that they are calling each other by name. Uh, my translator is a single male and unfortunately in the African culture single men are very uncomfortable around women <laughs> and uh, the majority of my clinic was women telling me their female issues or having to undress at certain times and um, you know I remember my translator telling me he was clearly uncomfortable but that he would only be doing this for Jesus <laughs> at one point however we were working so we were seeing so many patients and it was so hot um, I looked up at him and I thought he was going to pass out. Um, so I asked him if he was okay and he said no, he felt dizzy. Um, and we, we took a break and he ended up <laughs> becoming a patient himself. So today we've been working uh, with a makeshift clinic in Baraka cooperation with the Calvary Chapel here, treating people as best we can with the medications that were donated. We saw almost 200 people here today with various conditions. We basically uh, treated them for malaria and dehydration and associated things like that until we ran out of medications. And obviously with all that, we've been sharing the love of Jesus by washing feet, cleansing wounds, and just ministering people as best we can. So, God bless you. So we had a, a great couple of days, actually, you know, the first week with the team coming in. Uh, really a, a blessing for me to be able to spend the time and to work together with uh, so many great people. But their time was limit, limited. Uh, the doctors had to get back to their practices. And so the, the uh, pharmacist and the nurses and the paramedics, you know, all had to leave. And so our work continued on. Um, the first thing, our first order of, of business, if you will, after that is the school. And we've been working with this school for years and, and there's over a thousand students at the Lid for Kids uh, sponsor school there. And so they had an assembly plan planned for Monday. Unfortunately, the medical team had to leave and miss that, but it's all about saying thank you. And so these kids gather together, they learn songs and skits and stuff in English just so that they can present them for us and being there. They had their awards ceremony and, and all the kids that did the best in their classes all received awards and we were able to be there to see that, to see how well uh, many of those students are doing. And just to hear their expression of, a, of appreciation is very heartwarming. I wish that more people could see that because uh, the only support that comes for that school is through the Our Live for Kids sponsored program. That for the next two, three days, we're working, tearing down old classrooms, uh, building up new classrooms and we, the, the last of the flimsy wooden ones uh, were torn down, uh, which is a good thing, and uh, be able to do concrete and brick and steel and, and start some better structures uh, for the classrooms.
How many classrooms? Three. Three. more remote village churches. I mean, it's it's uh, quite a experience for new people, especially. And Misha is one of the more remote ones and can only get there by boat. Um, so especially with the with the flooding, there are challenges that come with that. So we take a, a boat uh, on the lake uh, to the shore, and then we've got a hike four or five miles uh, into Misha. And because of the location, Many of the times we haven't had a lot of time to, to stay there. So uh, my goal this year was we're going to stay the night over in Misha so that we can have a, a little bit more time. Well, so for Americans to go and stay the night in an African village is, is a little more complicated. So we had to bring tents so that we have a place to sleep that protects us from the mosquitoes. And we had to bring mattresses in so that we're not sleeping on the ground. And we've done that other places as well, which they become a great gift. We can leave those as gifts to the pastor and other leaders in the community, oftentimes, you know, tribal chiefs will get a gift of a mattress. So we're tearing all that, all that stuff in. Okay, this is uh, the progress of the of the church construction at Misha. We thank God that these guys, what they have been doing, they have been working. We thank God, the progress is good. Uh, church progress in Fizzy. We're doing the temporary building because their bamboo one was falling apart, but it's still a lot of work to get this level. This is Raure. Raure? Oh, he's six years old. With me is my new friend, Adolf. We're at his home, learning a little bit about the Down Syndrome young people here in Baraka. And he is not going to school, just like the friend that we just met before coming here, because school is too difficult, because there's no special training. But he wants to go to school. He wants to wear a uniform, right? Uniform? 
Ibu, and uh, he's my new Rafiki. So we are going to see what we can do to get kids like Adolf into school here at the Lid for Kids sponsored school at Cabin Chapel Baraka. And we appreciate your help. Now that we're looking into helping the Down syndrome people, we know there's 35 in uh, Baraka alone uh, so far and 45 in, in the area. Um, the thought is that this is there's lots of room here, it'd be a great place to, to build a place for having the group activities, possibly even group home and school where the Down syndrome can have their own, their own place because they're not treated well in the society at all. They don't. So why do we keep doing this? We have the difficulty of the travel, uh, the challenges of uh, the flooding and the lake and the roads. You have opposition, um, demonic activity. We have military, we have rebels. Um, that's, that's all part of life in Africa. And that's really why we keep going. We see the suffering of the people, um, the medical outreach to be able to minister to so many people physically. This is the issues that they deal with uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So to be able to go and be an encouragement to these young churches that are growing, to be able to be there as a part of Calvary Chapel Baraka with a longtime friend now, uh, coming up on 15 years with Pastor Asikulu and to know and see the suffering that he goes through, that his community goes through, that his church goes through. Even now as we're recording this, he is in the hospital with malaria and typhoid and is very sick and that's just that's part of their life and so you know, if we can go and encourage the believers and further the kingdom we will and i'll i'll keep going as long as god allows me and take whoever will go with me who can handle a little bit of uh, inconvenience and and rough living for a little while but we always see fruit and so to see fruit from the outreach is to see the over a thousand kids at this school that we're sponsoring to see the uh, you know, 365 people that were ministered to medically and then their extended families and to see the follow up, you know, coming from that. There's always the opportunity to see we serve a great God. He's doing a great work uh, here in our communities and our local churches. You know, this country needs revival, but there is a, a place there in the Congo where the word is spreading. The churches are growing. The needs are tremendous. And we just take our little bit that we can and we, we disperse it while we can. Thanks for being a part of it.